Uh, well, the uh, final resolution of this has been painfully obvious to everyone except for perhaps Speaker Johnson and House Republican leadership. The reality is we need a clean continuing resolution, a clean CR, not something that has either a Democratic or Republican poison pill. Um, that is the only way we're going to resolve this. And the sooner Speaker Johnson realizes that, the better off we will be. I am hopeful, however, uh, that we will see that finally. Uh, and that that's how we will resolve this to avoid a government shutdown. It might not be a, a six-month CR the way the Speaker would want, but at least until the end of the year, which has been past practice uh, many a time over the last decade. Well, so if it is just for December, leaving it to this Congress that is sitting now to sort out rather than punting it uh, to the next one, Congressman, is there anything else that should be short, uh, sorted out there as well, like debt limit negotiations rather than waiting until next year? Well, I, as you may know from previous times I, I've been on with you guys, um, I am the author of the Debt Ceiling Reform Act. We will be back on the clock in terms of the need to raise the debt ceiling come uh, midnight, December 31st into January 1st. Now, of course, that won't be the actual X date. That will be some months later. Sure. But I've long believed that we need a permanent resolution of the debt ceiling. The sooner we get that done, the better, the better for markets and the better for the American people so that we would have the security and the knowledge that we won't either by design or accident end up uh, jeopardizing the full faith and credit of the United States and bringing about what many economists left and right believe would be a worldwide recession. I want to ask you how you would describe this moment we're in here economically, Congressman. The Federal Reserve began a new regime by cutting 50 basis points yesterday, more than some actually expected, a bit less than some Democratic lawmakers were calling for. But it signifies a moment. And President Biden, speaking just about a half an hour ago at the Economic Club here in Washington, said it was not a moment of victory, but one of progress. This is something that I know that you have been working with on the administration for years here to bring down prices. Is it not time to declare victory now that the Fed is cutting? It's quite clear. We are achieving the soft landing. We have increased projections now of 3% growth for this quarter, combined with inflation that is reaching the 2% target. And that's what gave the Federal, uh, what the, gave the Federal Reserve and the FOMC the confidence to be able to initiate this series of rate cuts, beginning with a robust 50-point basis point cut. They would not uh, have done that had they believed that inflation was still a, a major concern. We've had rates too high for too long, in my view. This is the highest that they've been in some 17 years. And I'm glad now that the Federal Reserve recognizes it's time to bring them lower. But make no mistake about it, mm -hmm. this did not happen by accident. The uh, record of achievement in the policies of this administration is why the United States leads the world in the recovery from the pandemic. Well, Congressman, as the cutting cycle has now begun, there's also the question of how long it might last as we move to a new presidency next year, either a Harris presidency or another Trump one. We've spoken with many economists here on Bloomberg TV and radio who have actually suggested this easing cycle could potentially be cut short if inflationary policies are pursued by either candidate. For Donald Trump, of course, we're thinking of tariffs for lower taxes, but Kamala Harris, too, is talking about different subsidies, uh, lower tax rates for uh, some individuals. Both of these people want to spend and potentially have less uh, revenue coming in simultaneously, Congressman. So what would you say to those concerns that even if it is a Harris presidency, inflation might rear its head once again? Well, first, let's be clear. Uh, recently, Goldman Sachs, not exactly known as a bastion of liberalism or progressivism, Goldman Sachs released reports concluding that the Harris economic agenda would help the economy, while at the same time, the Trump tariff agenda and his overall economic policies would spike inflation and lead to a dramatic increase in the deficit and the debt. So it's quite clear that, that both candidates are not alike. Now, in terms of how that would impact Fed policy, I trust Jay Powell and, and the Federal Reserve governors at their word that they will be data dependent. Hopefully, come January, it'll be a continuation of policies that have brought down inflation and not this sudden tariff, another word, another way of saying tax agenda that Trump wants to pursue. 
You must be encouraged by some of the polls that we're seeing, Congressman, and I'll just stay right in your state of Pennsylvania. Siena and New York Times out today. Harris 50, Trump 46 in the swing state of Pennsylvania. We saw another from Quinnipiac yesterday showing Kamala Harris uh, turning around a massive gap that, that Joe Biden had with Donald Trump when it came to who you trust to handle the economy, pulling even in Pennsylvania. If this is a standoff right now, how does it break out for one candidate or the other? The message in your state. Yeah, well, first, I didn't get too um, down when the polls weren't looking good, and I'm not going to get, uh, I'm not going to experience a rational exuberance now that the polls are, are looking good uh, on, on our side. An, an old Greenspan reference for longtime viewers. Um, but I, uh, I do think, however, um, that over the next seven weeks or 47 days, we will see the polls move around a little bit, as they have. Um, I always expected, and I've said this before, that this race would come down to Pennsylvania, and I think Pennsylvania will be exactly as it was in 2016 and exactly as it was in 2020. Pennsylvania will be a one-point race. Right now, I would rather be our side than the other side, because in the end, I think middle-class Pennsylvanians will recognize there's only one candidate in campaign that's actually speaking to their concerns, while the other side, Donald Trump, is talking about God knows what, but it certainly isn't middle-class economics. Well, when we consider the middle class economics, though, or some of the economic proposals that have put, put, been put forward uh, by the vice president and by the former president, there is some degree of overlap, Congressman. I could think of no tax on tips, for example, for service workers, potentially the child tax credit as well. And I wonder, given your seat on Ways and Needs, whether or not you're the majority or still in the minority in the new Congress, if there are going to be some areas of bipartisan compromise in tax policy specifically that you think we could end up with no matter who becomes president. Well, you know, it's interesting. Uh, while Donald Trump and J.D. Vance talk a good game on the child tax credit, then when there's the opportunity to actually expand it and make it law, you don't see really any Republican support for that in the United States Senate. Heck, J.D. Vance didn't even bother to show up for the vote. Um, now, in terms of the no taxation on tips, look, that is something that I'm very interested in. There have been a number of Democrats over the years who have talked about that. But the reality is, at the same time, Donald Trump is also talking about further cutting corporate tax rates. When he was in office, contrary to what he talked about, when he was in office, his number one priority was the attempt to take away Obamacare from 30 million Americans. And then he followed that up with his large Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, which ended up ballooning the debt by $2 trillion. And as you know, 83 percent of it went to the richest 1 percent. So sorry if, if I don't trust Donald Trump's word when it comes to who he would be looking out for in taxation. Well, you're about to walk into a grand debate here on the expiring Trump era tax cuts. And of course, I know the, the former president has changed his opinion on the SALT deduction, for instance. <laughs> so this could take on a lot of different forms. Something that's a lot more immediate is the cost of gas, energy in a state like yours. Uh, the president talked about that at the Economic Club, Congressman. I notice here, according to AAA, the average price for a gallon of uh, regular unleaded in Pennsylvania, $3.36. How important is it going to be for that number to come down? And I'm asking you that as well against the backdrop of this debate over fracking. I know Kamala Harris has changed her position on that, but it's something that, of course, hits very close to home in Pennsylvania. How important will that be in deciding your state? Yeah. So first, let me just say, because I can't resist on salt. I, I, I laughed out loud when I saw yesterday Donald Trump came out against his own law. Donald Trump is the reason why taxpayers in many states, including in suburban Philadelphia, no longer have the ability to fully deduct their um, property taxes and state and local income tax. That tax increase was because of Donald Trump. Now suddenly he's against it. I'm sure tomorrow he'll have a third position on it. But as far as gas prices, uh, let's not forget, gas prices today on average are 70 cents lower at the pump than they were just a year ago. Gas prices spiked as a result of Vladimir Putin's invasion of Ukraine that began two and a half years ago. Fortunately, prices have dropped considerably since then. And today, the United States of America leads the world in energy production. We literally lead the world in oil production. I think that part of the story probably hasn't gotten out the way it should. 
I would fully expect a President Harris to continue pursuing a balanced approach when it comes to energy. 